Hello communities, so great that you are back. We have a new data and this is telling us, hey, we have a little tiny insignificant LLM model, a 27 million model, and it has a performance that goes beyond cloud Opus 4 on the HI leaderboard. How is this possible? Well, I just went there, I took a screenshot for you and here you have it here on the y-axis, you have the score and here we have Cloud Opus 4 in all its glory, in all its beauty and look at this. Above it, we have a 27 million, not a billion, a million free trainable parameter model, a hierarchical reasoning model, HRM, and it beats in RSC AGI benchmark Cloud Opus 4. How is this possible? Tell me. Well, easy, you will say as a subscriber of my channel, because more than a month ago, a month, a week ago, I did this video. I explained here in detail the hierarchical reasoning model as I understood it here just days after the technical report were published. Now, in this video, I showed you here the performance data for ARC AGI 1 and the authors claimed here for their model outperform everything from deep sea cloud O3 here 40%. Now, today, no, yesterday, August 15, there was a new report published. And here we have here the ARC price team and they say, you know what? We want to verify this independently. So we're going to take this code and we're going to run our independent evaluation. We want to say, is this possible? Can a 27 million LLM outperform here the complete cloud model? So they published here yesterday their report and they have some beautiful insights I want to show you. At first they say, you know what? After a runtime of more than nine hours on a little bit of a different data set, not a public evaluation score, but a more semi-private say, yeah, we can confirm it is, in our test, 32% performance. So not here, like in this particular data set, 40%, but 32%. But this is, wow, this is absolutely fascinating. They even tell us here, their observed drop in high percentage point is on the high side of a normal variation, especially if you have it a public set and a semi-private set and whatever. So they said, yeah, this result shows that indeed something interesting is going on with HRM, hierarchical reasoning models. And you might say, this is amazing. Now, the Odyssey of this new test said, you know what, we go with full scope. We have a testing for the high and the low loop performance. We were very here, the hold conditions. We will have crosstalk transfer learning. We will investigate the augmentation cord from here, HRM, and we will have a look at the size. So what are they finding? Let's jump in. Let's have a look at the result. And I make a screenshot that is absolutely precise, no interpretation at all. Finding number one, they tell us here in their new report, the hierarchical architecture, the inner architecture with the slow and fast thinking, with the high and low loop, the inner loop structure had a minimal performance impact. If they are compared this to a transformer. Now, this is a statement that is interesting here as a first finding, because if you go for one refinement loop, I'm absolutely with you. Now, in blue, we have HRM and in orange, let's call it, we have a classical transformer now. And you say, OK, it's uh, yeah, I would say the same. But just look at two loops. I mean, yeah, they give us the data you know, for the refinement loop. If I have two looping, look at this. HRM takes the lead uh, instead of with a transformer 29.9. I go to 35.5. This is a jump I take here. You know, I've done some crazy coding where I just want to increase here two or three percentage point. If I take more than five, yeah, absolutely. I go with HRM. Now, the more you increase the number of refinement loops, this difference diminishes. There will be a saturation happening. But listen, for two loops, fast, absolutely, I take this performance jump. So finding number one for me, uh, maybe with an asterisk, because I would go for two loop performance. Finding number two, this is one of the main findings. They say the underdocumented outer loop refinement process is he a substantial performance driver? And I said, what? Underdocumented? So I checked here my own video because I, hey, you know, and I have a look here at 14 minutes, 49 seconds in my video. Now, okay, I, I have it. Supervision, beautiful. The last calculation here. This is, of course, your training phase. 
And I have here the learning signal I have the segment beautiful I explained the regularization, the foundation for ACT, the adaptive computation time mechanism makes this possible for the stopping criteria. Okay, Jack, I have it. Second, at 16 minute 29 seconds, I explain the inner mechanisms for ACT. I'll show you here the Q hat with the hold condition, with the continue, then the decision rules, the learning here, the values, standard Q learning setup. Beautiful, Jack. And then in the third paragraph, they, in the new study, they tell us here, you know, this is similar. We found that this is similar to the Universal Transformer. Guess what? A month ago, I already had Universal Transformer and explained this to you. Beautiful. So I'm not a complete idiot, Jack. What is really interesting, already then I told you, you know, there are key innovations and there are two key innovations. And the first one is exactly this inner loop, this high, low structure thinking, no? This thinking low and thinking fast and whatever you call it. And this was part one. But as the second key innovation, I always refer to you to this uh, deep supervision. Eh? If you have the inner loop finished and you have the contribution from high and the contribution from low, and then you combine it and you have now an outer refinement loop that is happening. And during the training phase, it is called a deep supervision. Yeah. Okay. Jack, I have it in my video. So under documented, not in my video. Great. Yeah, I've seen in the commentary to the, techni to the new technical report, people are mixing up some technical terms. So let's just be clear. Whatever is called an outer loop or outer refinement loop, to be more precise, described in the new analysis is also here referring here to the inference run, but also partly to the training phase. Now, this is now not really because in the learning phase in the original paper, I have here the M segment loop, and this was used here for the deep supervision I just showed you in the original paper. So careful, sometimes it's a really, you have to be really careful here in the technical terms that you're using, you have to understand, is this now in the inference run, is this here in the learning process, where exactly do I use which technical term? Yeah, if you want to have it real simple, when you see deep supervision somewhere, you can think of the training process that happens here on the outer loop itself. And when you see outer refinement loop, you just think here of the reasoning process that is the outer loop in action after the training is done and you are now here in the inference run. So I hope to make clear here these two technical terms. Now, finding number two is here exactly now what have they found. And they had a clear goal. They said, hey, we want to understand what impact the outer refinement loop as well as ACT has on the overall performance. So what they did they varied here the number of maximum outer loops during the training while going with the maximum loop during the inference run. Great. And you see, hey, look, there is a significant jump here in the performance of this system. If we go from one loop, two loops, four loops, eight loops, 16 loop, you see the absolute performance, the max at 39%, and then we have saturation or maybe a little bit of decrease. Great. So what they tell us, hey, look, the results indicate that the refinement outer loop is an essential driver for the reasoning performance of HRM systems. Absolutely. Look, one loop, two loop, four loops, eight loops at eight percent. So yeah, real nice. Now, if you are a subscriber of my channel, you know that this is going to come. Question to you. Why is the linear increase not continuing? Why is there a plateau? Think about it. It's rather simple if you've seen one of my last videos. Finding number three. Now, this is important because a lot of people said, hey, wait, is there not a containment in the training of this system if you know that you do here the training for a particular benchmark test? Because, and they were absolutely clear and transparent here in the original HRM paper, they said, listen, we trained here on augmented version here of particular sets, and we take the 400 tasks from the ARC AGI training set. So they tell us, listen, we do this, no? and we have then augmented, even then augmented versions. So we have 400 tasks from this particular benchmarks. And now we have such a good performance in the performance run here. So you might say, hey, wait a minute. Do we have some cross-pollination, no? some inference, some cross-talk going on here about transfer learning? And they tell us here, hey, we did all the tests. No, absolutely fine. No problem. 
we have separated learning sets and separated training sets should happen nothing at all. Now, finding four is for me personally the most interesting finding. It's not two, but for me it's four. And they say, hey, the pre-training task augmentation is critical. Now, this is beautiful because this goes now in a direction I will show you in my next video that how you prepare and present the external environmental data to your AI agent is essential. If you can reduce the complexity or have a more intense training set for a higher complexity task, your LM will perform better. Of course. And they tell us, hey, HRM uses data augmentation like rotation, flips, or recoloring. So what does it mean? We have here the original task, and this is a particular geometric shape. And what HRM is now actively doing to generate more training data, and they say, yeah, augmenting data is a common matter for deep learning. What we do, we generate additional training data, like we wanted our system is able to understand that this is the identical geometric structure if we just rotate it for 90 degree, or if we have a mirroring, or if we have a recoloring, or a repositioning. So they explicitly train their HRM model, they tell us we do this, and in the orientation here for this AGI-1 benchmarks. Absolutely transparent. And they give us here translation, rotation, flip, scholar, whatever. Great. And they say, why do we do this? We don't want here a better benchmark score. Of course not. But we want to generate data so that the AI system learns here invariance. So whatever you have here as a translation and invariance or any other CPT uh, symmetry, anti-symmetry breaking, we want that the model has so many training data from so many configuration that it understands whatever is this geometric shape, is it rotated, is it translated, has it been mirrored? The system should understand it is the same model and I can do the job. Now, at the moment, after reading another paper and not having a deeper look at the code, but just reading the paper, I'm a little bit, I don't know. So. On the one hand, I said, great, they are tr absolutely transparent to say, listen, we did a specific training implementation of our HRM models, our little 27 million model, so that it will perfectly align and it is really tailored for the ERC AGI test. So they are clear, we do this. And guess what? They get an excellent score for this. Beautiful. And I say, hmm. Is this model able to generalize to ARC AGI 2? I am not sure. But never mind, because there's an extreme positive sort here. No? You say, listen, if I can take a 27 million model, an HRM model, and I know what my task is in my company, or wherever you are, in theoretical physics, or you are in biomedical, whatever, and you say, I know what I need from my AI, not a generalist. I need an absolute expert in a very narrow domain for a very clearly defined set of tasks that it can absolutely define. I have a training data set for each of those tasks. I can generate synthetic alteration of this data set with beautiful perfection. And then I just want that this AI expert, very narrow expert, outperforms any other AI system on this planet for this very specific task of mine in my company for biomolecular design or whatever. Then this makes sense. And then this performance of 27 million with this simple augmentation is absolutely breathtaking. Because this means we can build models that run on a simple laptop and you don't need to pay OpenAI GPT-5 further fine-tuning or whatsoever, you can have absolute tiny specialist AI system. And this is what fascinates me on this study. Okay, back to the study. <laughs> further, absolutely fascinating. So we know data augmentation is happening. And the authors told us in the original HRM paper, we went with only 1,000 augmentation. This is a tiny, tiny training data set size, no? compared to the hundreds of thousands or millions of other training data set sizes. And they say, you know, only with 1,000, we achieve this performance. 
And now in this new evaluation, the author said, you know what? We go from 1000 to just 300. And you know what? It worked perfectly. 300 is here the light blue line. Look, yeah, what we have on the x-axis, we have the augmentation at the inference. And on the y-axis, we have the score at pause at 2. And color-coded is here the training augmentation. So inference augmentation, color-coded training augmentations. No, for zero augmentation, we have a dot. This is the dot here. I don't know if you can see it. I recorded it in 4K. So you should see here, there's a little dot at 10%. Great. No augmentation. But if you do a pre-training and you say, I know what I want. I know the task that I need from an AI to perform at extreme high levels. You have 10 augmentation. And you have here this orange line and you see exactly from 0 to 10. Yeah, look at the performance increase if you give this pre-training data sets who can generate synthetic data with augmented rotational symmetries or whatever. If you go to light pink here, 30 augmentation, light pink is here. Nice. Look, you are close here. This is the saturation level. Yeah? You are really close to the saturation level with just 30 augmentation. And this is crazy. A 27 million model. And now you need only 30, 3 zero augmentation. This means 3% of the original 1000. And you come close to almost... 4% of the maximum performance, you have 96 performance, absolute. You're just missing here the last 4% to the saturation plateauing out. You say, my goodness, this is an efficient training data set. But there's a voice in my back now and says, hey, buddy, this is so specific for only this benchmark. This is only specific and designed for ARC AGI 1. And there's another voice in my head, you know, you now you can imagine how it feels to be me, that says, yeah, but imagine if you do only biophysics or if you do only mathematics in a very narrow domain, can you imagine GPT-5? Who needs GPT-5? Who needs the big models? Those are generalist models for 1 billion people that needs everything. But if you know your AI task, my goodness, this opens up complete new ideas. Yeah, we have here GitHub, here you have exactly everything is available two days ago, all the evaluators, the data set configuration, all the asset, all the model, everything. This will be my afternoon, but I just wanted to record a video before I dig in into this. The authors tell us we do have open question and we have some ideas for some future work here, evaluating these models further. Beautiful ideas. Have a look at this. General ideas like, hey, can we use these HIM models to generalize now beyond its training data? Now, answer is what I think is no. Maybe you can have, I don't know, a cool back lab or some clipping here in the reward function that you can press it back down. More about this in my next video. Or is this refinement idea generalizable to other approaches here? No? Or which specific augmentation types leap to a higher performance if you have different tasks? If you have, I don't know, three-dimensional molecular design here for new medicine, you will have exactly understanding what kind of rotation you need with your peptide chains and with all your different molecular intertwined and inter whatever structures. How many knots do you want to have? How many not solving problems you want to solve here? So if you have absolute specific task, small models seem to be outstanding. And I really mean outstanding if you compare it here to an ordinary Claude Opus 4, which is not, let's say, cheap. Okay. <laughs> so these are my first thoughts. I hope I provided here you an idea of what is happening right now here in AI. I find it absolutely fascinating. And maybe I see you in my next video.